Well, good morning. Um, I got a, a little bit of a, a cool opportunity earlier this week. I was helping work with other pastors in the Boise area to do some of the stuff we have started doing here, living missionally, um, literally loving our neighbors and all of that kind of stuff. But um, it was interesting as I was walking through it that God did something in my heart as well. As he brought something up, a, a moment up in my heart that I have experienced a lot. Uh, these are one of those moments that we might call a, a Kairos moment, a moment of time that God wants to reach in and do something in your life with. And so he was doing that in me as well. Uh, but it was one that had come up time and time again. And, and that is the truth of uh, the reality that I actually have a really, really good dad. Like my family's good. We're tight all of that. Uh, and I have a good dad. I have a good relationship with my dad. We still talk on, on a fairly regular basis. And uh, the, the interesting thing, though, and, and it's the thing that came up is oftentimes I still try to gain my dad's approval. Yeah, like there's, there's no like childhood wounds there. Not that I'm aware of, I guess. <laughs> But uh, when we talk to each other, when we're on the phone or when we're uh, on a Zoom call together because he's still in Michigan, um, I'll, I'll catch myself doing the same thing, and that is trying to tell stories that I think maybe he'll find impressive or reminding him of some of the coolest things that I've done or find ways to humble brag in the midst of the conversation. And then I catch myself and I think, why am I doing that? Like there's been no lack of affection or no a lack of affirmation on the part of my dad. In fact, he gives that freely. We end every single call with, okay, love you. I right, love you too. I don't question whether my dad loves me yet. I keep finding in my heart the reality that I do something we all do. And that is we actually, though we don't like them, we hold on to and live out paradox quite easily. The paradox that I found myself living in the midst of is though I know the truths of scripture that we've been talking about over the last month, that we are in Christ, that we are children and co-heirs and all of that, everything that God says about me, I know to be true. I, I have it conceptually, but in my heart, I hold on to this paradox that what I find equally as true is that I gain my identity from my dad. Now, that is very uh, dangerous because the truth is it's inevitable. At some point, my dad is going to let me down or uh, I won't be as impressive as I think I am to my dad. Or maybe my dad will just leave us. And at some point, my dad will pass away and I'm going to have to deal with that reality. It's in those moments that we realize that we live out these paradoxes quite easily. We don't like them intellectually. We know that a paradox is two things that are, are uh, opposed to each other and can't exist in the same space, yet we actually hold on to paradoxical thinking quite easily, especially when it comes to our identities. Now, in our identity, it might look like uh, knowing conceptually that God is our identity, that our identity is in Jesus, but maybe we've also put a parent or some other person in our family of origin into that place of God in our life. And you see, what that does for us is uh, the place that we put, or the person that we put in place of God is the place we derive our identity from. That's the truth. And so when we put somebody else in our family in that place of God, we're saying, you have permission to identify me. Now, maybe uh, for you, the paradox uh, thinking is not a parent or another family member. Maybe the paradoxical thinking for you is something you can do or accomplish. Maybe on the other end of that paradox, outside of the biblical concept that maybe you hold on to, is uh, accumulating things. It's, it's what you have or what you can amass or um, some other aspect of your appetite. In fact, we've talked about uh, things that touch our identity in three different terms before, and I want to remind us of those things, that uh, we oftentimes think of our identity in terms of our appetite, the question of, do I have enough? Or our ambition, can I do enough? Or approval, can I be enough? 
These are different idols that we might put in place of God, and we give permission to those things to identify us. Now, the problem is, uh, um, most of the time, that paradox thinking isn't made known to us until something like trial or hardship or some other crisis of life comes to the forefront. We realize very quickly that we've been holding in tension two opposing ideas. Because you can't be identified by this thing and this thing at the same time. We are going to dig into it and find out that there's only one solid thing. Because when crisis hits, when suffering hits, it tears down the lesser truth, the lesser identity. If we uh, hold on to that paradoxical thinking, we'll realize when those moments of crisis hit, that one of those things is stable and one of those things is unstable. One of those things is touchable. The other one is untouchable. And we're going to find that out as we close out chapter 8 of Romans today. So if you want to turn there, we've been, uh, if you're just joining us, we've been in chapter 8 of Romans for a whole month. And there's a lot in there, right? It's thick. And we didn't even talk about all of it. We talked about most of it. (laughs) So if you haven't yet, I would still encourage you to read back through even if this is your first time reading back through chapter 8 of Romans and just soaking it in, praying through it, uh, thinking about it, meditating on it, because it is so, so good. Today we want to close out um, chapter 8 of Romans by reading verses 31 through the end of the chapter. So let's start there. If you don't have a Bible, we'll have it on the screen for you. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is uh, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns us? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor future nor powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's good stuff, right? Yeah. One of the identities, and maybe one among many, it is possible for us to have more than one. One of our identities is touchable. It's shakeable. It can be taken from us. But there is another identity that we can have that is untouchable, and it's what Paul shares with us now. Now, Paul is getting to the end of this really beautiful section of thinking and writing in Romans chapter 8, and he's starting to pull a, a lot of pieces that he's shared together. That's why he starts verse 31 saying, what then shall we say in response to these things? These things not just being what he's already stated at the beginning of chapter 8, but what he's written since the beginning of the letter. And so you might want to go back and and maybe do a little bit of skimming and see about all of these things that, that Paul is writing about. But he pulls all of these strings together and he answers it with this. If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, for doesn't just mean pro. It doesn't just mean I am, uh, I am in favor of you, although that is certainly true. Paul is using a piece of language here that also means on your behalf. That if God is on your behalf. Now that's significant because there's some legal terms that are about to come up uh, uh, that Paul is going to be using. And so what Paul is doing is he's setting up God as our defender. He's saying that in the legal court of heaven and earth, God is on your side. 
That's a beautiful thing because what's about to be said, it is significant that God is for us. He is on our behalf. All of the work that he's accomplished, everything that he's done, it is for us. Now, that might be called into question sometimes by a lot of the hardships and trials that Paul will will talk about. And we just last week discussed a little bit. I love how early church father, John Chrysostom, who lived um, right around 400 AD, he wrote this. Yet those that be against us, so far are they from thwarting us at all, that even without their will, they become to us the causes of crowns and procurers of countless blessings, in that God's wisdom turneth their plots unto our salvation and glory. See how really no one is against us. So Paul takes this uh, examination that he's about to do on all of this suffering and the things uh, that he's talked about with trials and hardship, and he pulls that together and he says, you are for us. Chrysostom reminds us that even when it it seems like things are against us, because here's the truth, there is a whole world, uh, a spiritual reality that is against those who follow Jesus. And Chrysostom reminds us that even when it feels like things are against us, that people are opposing us, that spiritual forces are opposing us, because God is for us, he takes all of those things and he works them for our good. Paul just said that a few verses earlier in the chapter of Romans, that if you love God, he will work all of that evil that is intended against you for good. What that means is that uh, God doesn't promise to save us from all suffering, but he will redeem all the suffering. That though uh, people mean something against us for evil, God will turn that into crowns and into blessings. It's good. He continues on. Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he also, not also, along with him, Jesus, graciously give us all things? Now, there's a phrase that we've mentioned before, that uh, in all of life, we have to think gospel. We have to think in terms of the good news of Jesus. We have to think in terms of the work that Jesus has done and who he is revealed to us. And that's exactly what Paul is reminding us of. He says, uh, there are forces that are against us, but God is for us. And how do we know God is for us? Because he did not spare his own son. Paul points back to the gospel of Jesus and he says, listen, in all of these things, think gospel. Think about the good news of Jesus and the work he has done that in the midst of this, God has not even spared his own son. How much more will he give you everything else? We often like to play the fire game. The fire game is if your house is burning down, what do you save first? Right? Weird game. Weird game. Yeah. But what would you save first? And never at the top of our list is it like, you know what? I'm going to go grab those cooking utensils just had a pampered chef party, spent tons of money. I'm not letting those things go up in flames. No, we always go and we say, no, first, you know what? I'm saving my kids. No offense, Janine, then my wife. I love you. We always look to the people in our lives first, right? We know that if there is, if there is hardship or there is a fire going on in our house, the first thing we collect is not the lowest of the low, the, the less important things. We are going to gather the most important things to us first. And the most important thing is people, specifically our children, right? Those that uh, we are responsible for, those that we have a, a deep a, a connection and, and love for. God says that same love... God did not set aside on your behalf. In fact, God gave his son on your behalf. How how much more will he not uh, give you all of the lesser things, all of the pampered chef things, right? All the things on the low end of the totem pole, God didn't spare his son, so he will give you those other things. Chrysostom, again, reminds us of this in only the way that old Johnny can, and that is is by saying, why be dubious? about the chattels when you have the Lord. That's a good quote, isn't it? It's not as helpful as it is just cool. And that's why I included it in here because we don't say words like dubious or chattel anymore, partly because we have no clue what that means, right? So dubious simply means why doubt the chattels, the the possessions when you have the Lord? 
Now, first and foremost, I want you to take away this. Please use the word dubious and chattels more often, okay? <laughs> it's just worthwhile. But maybe even more important is this, that God sending his own son on our behalf proves that he is not willing to withhold anything from us. We don't have to doubt our care and concern. We don't have to doubt our affirmation. We don't have to doubt our source of approval. We don't have to doubt our source of, of being enough or doing enough or having enough because God is in it. He has already showed us his deep, deep love for us because he did not spare his most precious possession. How much more so will he give you anything that he has? Now, that is not just license to treat God like a genie. That is a license to take God at his word that he loves you more deeply than anything in the entire universe. If we are going to assume on God, let us assume on his love for us. So don't be dubious about the chattels when you have the Lord. All right? Let's continue on. So Paul lays all of this out, and then in verse 33, he says, Who will bring any charge? Here's that legal language, that courtroom language again. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Paul brings this courtroom language back in. He says, who is going to bring a charge against those who are in Christ? A few weeks ago, we started talking about our identity is in Christ. Meaning that the moment you placed your faith in Jesus, you were incorporated into his body. Meaning that you've been a part of the life of Christ, a part of the death of Christ, a part of the resurrection of Christ. And now you with him are children and heirs seated at the right hand of the throne of God the Father in Christ. But that's significant. That's huge. So Paul says, in light of all of that, who can bring a charge against those who are in Christ? And he says, essentially, no one, because it's God who justifies. Now, justification, just to remind us, is a legal declaration that though the evidence is against you, you have been pronounced by God innocent. That the, the charge is overwhelmingly guilty, Right? You've broken, I've broken relationship with God the Father. We have put something else. We have put a different identity in place of God the Father. And in light of that, we are still in Christ and pronounced innocent. So it's God who justifies us. Then the next question Paul asks is, who is the one who condemns? Condemnation is, uh, is getting to the understanding of who's going to pay the penalty for this wrongdoing. Okay, you've been declared innocent, now who's going to pay for this offense? Who's going to pay the penalty? Who's going to do the time? Paul's answer is no one. No one gets what they deserve. No one. Because Jesus died. If you are in Christ, you died with Christ. Okay? More than that, Jesus was raised to life. In Christ, you were raised to life, living a new life. And now he's at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. This is more language to let us know that God is for us. Jesus is standing before the Father on our behalf, pleading our innocence and, and lack of need for condemnation because he's already taken it on himself. This is on our behalf. This is the work that, that Jesus has done for us. And Paul reminds us again, this is the gospel. This is the good news. He points back again in the midst of all of this to the reality of the gospel. And then he sums it all up with one more question saying, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Wait, the love of Christ. Yes, that's what Paul has been talking about all along is all of this is to show the love of God for us in the person of Jesus. That when Paul talks about the life and the resurrection and the intercession of Jesus, he categorizes all of that in verse 35 as love of Jesus. We've read elsewhere in scripture, greater love has no one than this, that one laid down one's life for his friends. Jesus laid down his life for his friends. 
This is the ultimate act, the self-sacrifice. Why do we love movies about battle and sacrifice? Because we can't comprehend giving our lives on behalf of another person. And we love it when we see that level of sacrifice in somebody else. God is saying that's the ultimate sacrifice Jesus gave for us. Paul then gives a little bit more of a list. He says, shall trouble, shall hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now, what's interesting about this is it might seem like Paul is just kind of giving us this list of hypothetical scenarios, right? Well, what if you didn't have anything to wear? Or what if you were in danger? Or what if you were at the point of being killed for your faith? Could that separate you? Now, that might be hypothetical for us, but for Paul, that was not hypothetical. In fact, if you look back at the life of Paul, everything that Paul lists here, he has experienced in his life. For us, it's hypothetical. For Paul, this is real. And so Paul is, I think, even doing a little bit of introspection and saying, listen, if you ever doubt the love of God, just look at my life as an example. I have gone through, gone through all of these things. I have faced death itself, yet none of it can separate us from the love of God. He'll remind us about that in a second. To drive the point home a little bit further, Paul quotes Psalm 44, verse 22, when he says, For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Why does he quote this psalm? <laughs> He quotes it to, to remind us of something. That God's people have always suffered and will always suffer. That's a reality. Suffering is a part of life. Hardship is a part of life. We are in good company when we suffer, right? but there's hope at the end of it. It's not suffering just for suffering's sake. He says in verse 37, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than conquerors. In this list of, for us, hypothetical things, but for Paul, very real things in trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword, and that is not meant to be uh, uh, an exhaustive list. You could add to this a number of things. Any suffering on the, for, for the sake of Christ, in those things, we are more than conquerors. The word actually, because more than conquerors can kind of be a, a little bit difficult for, under, for us to understand. What do you mean, Paul, more than conquerors? Paul's language is actually super conquerors. Like the conqueror's conqueror, the hero's hero. In all of these things, we are super conquerors because we're so good, because we're so powerful, because we're so worthy. No, because we are in Christ. I think sometimes we get that confused. We like to quote things like, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, or I can, or I am uh, more than a conqueror, I'm a super conqueror. But we miss those last pieces of the verses, don't we? We miss the reality that our conquering is through him who loved us. What Paul is doing by quoting Psalm 44, what he's doing by laying out these lists and asking these questions is to tell us, listen, suffering has always been a part of our lives and it will always be a part of our lives. Your conquering is not always in the here and now. Your conquering is in Christ Jesus. Just as Chrysostom pointed out to us that though there is suffering in the world, God works it out as blessing and promise for our future. We are more than conquerors. We are super conquerors through him who loved us. And then Paul drives the point home. With personal conviction, he says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Love is the theme of this passage. That's the truth. Love is the theme. Love evident in the, in the work of Jesus in his life, death, and resurrection. Love affirmed in verse 35. Love affirmed here in verse 37. And then love affirmed again in verse 39. 
And he does it in a fun way. One of Ezra's, our middle son's uh, favorite games right now, is Opposites. <laughs> we'll be driving to school and, and he says, hey, dad, can we play opposites? And it takes me a little while to figure out what he's talking about. I don't know why. But it, every single time I'm like, oh, right, yes. Okay, so this is the game he wants to play. He wants me to say one word and then he says the opposite. All right. I'd encourage you to try to stump him. He's quite good. Okay. So we, we play this game of opposites. It turns out Paul is quite good at the game, too. Paul gives us a list of opposites to show us uh, the power and the, the reach of God's love for us. And he starts out with saying neither death nor life. Death and life, these are just ways of saying no matter your state of existence in this world, guess what? There are two options. You are either alive or dead. Okay? There's no other options. You are either dead or alive. And in the midst of that, he says, God's love will meet you. And there is nothing either in uh, your death or nothing in your life that can separate you from the love of God. That's good news. Yeah. Okay. And then he says, angels and demons. Angels and demons. Paul goes beyond our own state of existence and he starts talking about the spiritual world. Right? And, and in the spiritual world, we kind of think, think of two opposing forces. We have angels and we have uh, demons, or we have the Satan, we have the tempter. And in the midst of that, uh, it, it seems like there's two opposite ends of the spectrum. And these are things that are beyond our control. Quite often, if we were to experience one of these in the reality of our lives and know what's going on, we would probably get a little bit freaked out. Because this is a power that is beyond ours, right? Paul is saying not even that power can separate you from the love of God. So there's no state of our existence and there is nothing, uh, there is nothing either angel nor demon, no spiritual force in the world that can separate you from the love of God. The next opposite that Paul gives is present and future. Now present and future might uh, trip us up a, a, a bit, but present and future is about your present and your future. And by extension, Paul might even say your past. Sometimes we are, again, like Ezra. I was thinking about him a lot as I was reading this, this passage, and, and partly because when I started thinking about past and the things that we've done, the things that I've done, sometimes I realize that maybe we hide it a little bit better, but we are all a little bit like Ezra. Sometimes we'll be playing together, and just out of the blue, he slumps his shoulders so much that they almost touch in the middle, right? Because the kid just wears his heart on his sleeve. He wears his emotions out loud. And so he slumps everything. His whole body is just like crumbled into a, a little bit of a ball. And he'll tell me something like, hey, do you remember that time I did? And then he'll, he'll tell me something that he did that he just feels horrible about. Remember that time that I yelled, I'm sorry. It's like, buddy, we already covered that. I think the reality is that we're all like Ezra in that, that, that things from our past, present, and the things that we will do eventually, they catch up with us. And sometimes maybe we hide it a little bit better. Maybe we don't slump. Maybe instead our reaction is to like keep our chin up a little bit higher and not show that we're, we're uh, disappointed in ourselves in some way or we've let ourselves down. But the truth is something in our past causes us just to kind of crumple emotionally into a ball we realize that there's something that we've done that means that we are not enough, we haven't been enough, we haven't done enough, or we don't have enough. Paul says, those things too, they can't separate you from the love of God. Your past can't separate you from the love of God. Your present can't separate you from the love of God. And those things that are in your future, they can't separate you from the love of God. And not just the things you've done, but your past and, and what others have done to you and what they are doing to you or what they will do to you, those things can't separate you from the love of God either. Not just the wounds we inflict on ourselves or others, but the wounds that other people inflict on us. Those don't separate you from the love of God. They do not determine who you are. Right? Paul says after present and future, he says any powers. Now, normally Paul uses this word powers to talk about the miracles of God. We think, we don't, we don't 100% know, but we think Paul is now talking about maybe the power of the enemy, the tempter, the Satan, 
These powers that work against us, not even those things can separate us from the love of God, neither height nor depth. Now, height and depth can sometimes um, not mean a whole lot to us because we, can, we, we don't feel as limited as we once did. But height and depth, biblically speaking, actually oftentimes refers to um, heaven, which was considered above, or hell, which is considered below. Maybe when Paul writes this, he has in mind Psalm 139, 8. If I go up to the heavens, you are there. And if I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Meaning there is nowhere we can go. There is no physical reality. There is nothing in this whole world. Paul is just kind of wrapping it up uh, in terms of spiritual reality and in terms of physical reality right here saying there's nowhere we can go. In fact, nothing, anything else in all creation, Paul says, will be able to separate us from the love of God. There is nothing outside you that can separate you from the love of God, and there is nothing inside you that can separate you from the love of God. Are you part of the created order? Not rhetorical. Are you part of the created order? Yes. I am part of the created order. You and I cannot separate ourselves so easily from the love of God. We get tripped up into thinking that we are powerful enough, even in a negative way, to remove God's love from us, to to somehow disqualify ourselves from God loving us. When we feel that, the paradox comes to the forefront. When we feel that, we realize we've been living with this tension that ought not be there. And we started putting more emphasis on what we can do and what we can accomplish than on what God has accomplished on our behalf, what he has done for us. And it is God's love for us that keeps us from being uh, separated from God's love. In fact, Paul brings it right back at the very end. He says, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul wraps up love again in the person of Christ. How do we know that nothing can separate us? Because of Jesus. Because it is in Jesus that we are loved, the one who was killed but resurrected, the one who was resurrected and ascended to the the right hand of the throne of God, that he might always intercede for us. That is our place of love, a love that has already passed through death back into life and has ascended is the place we find our love. If love could have been killed, it already would have. They tried and they failed. This love is stronger than death. So good. It's like Paul is saying that the love of Jesus for us is absolutely untouchable. You will be, uh, you will be in crisis. You will have hardships. You will experience the full gambit of life. Yet the love of Jesus for you is untouchable. Here's our ultimate identity, friends is that we are loved with the untouchable love of God. We are loved, you and I are loved with the untouchable love of God. You may be able to be touched, but God's love for you cannot be touched. That is the good news. Now, sometimes I think we uh, oftentimes think of love as just... um, It's like when we tell our kids, um, you don't have to like them, but you do have to love them. God's love is not in, in spite of us. It's because of us. Right? God doesn't love us and then just have to... uh, grin and bear it when we do something wrong. He enjoys us. He loves us and he likes us. He's that kind of good. He's that kind of love. This is Paul's punchline. We are loved with the untouchable love of God. Because the reality is, he says, there's an accuser and there's an audience and there's spiritual forces that would love to see your demise and they know that you and I have earned it. But the Lord looks at them, he looks at you and he looks at the work Jesus did for you and he says, you are in Christ. You are children and heirs and the thing that keeps you there is my untouchable love. 
He knows that our identities are fragile. He knows that uh, crisis and that hardships and that what we think about ourselves, all of that can change. He knows that we are people who can live in the paradox of two different identities, and he wants, us to, he wants to point us to the one that is untouchable. He wants to point us to the one that will never fail, that nothing can take from us or uh, that we can even get rid of. And quite honestly, what I'm realizing is no level of age changes this paradoxical thinking for us. We always need to be reminded of the love of God. When I was in Boise this week, I got to help walk with a guy who um, was one of the pastors in the church and I was helping him process through a couple things that God was saying to him. He was about 70 years old and he was wrestling with the reality of paradoxical identity. He said, you know, everything that you're saying to me about God's identity, I know already. He said, but what I'm just realizing now is all through my life, I've struggled because my dad never was good to me. He never told me he loved me. And normally that wouldn't matter, right? Because I believe that God loves me and so that shouldn't matter. But what I'm realizing just now is that I've put, I put my dad and other father figures in the place of the heavenly father. And that has allowed my identity to be shaped. What he teaches us is, is it's not really a question of where is your identity, but to whom have you given permission to shape your identity? We don't choose where our identity is placed. We simply give other people permission or other things permission to shape our identity. It was massive breakthrough for this pastor at the end of the weekend when he said, you know what I'm leaving behind this weekend? I'm leaving behind this paradoxical thinking. I'm leaving behind putting my dad and other father figures who have failed me and who have mistreated me, I'm leaving behind putting them in the place of God the Father and I'm taking away the reality that God's love is the very thing that identifies me and I will no longer let anybody else identify me. Breakthrough comes even later in life. So we might even say youth and old age cannot separate us from the love of God. I want us to hold on to a couple of things as we go out this week. First, just some simple truths. You may already know them, but it helps me to be reminded of them on a regular basis. The first one being that your behaviors do not dictate your identity. When we start feeling this paradoxical thinking, I want you to remember this. I want you to pull it back out. My behavior does not identify, uh, does not dictate my identity. We're going to need that because quite often we struggle with this reality of uh, have I done enough to be loved or can I do enough to prove myself worthy of love? We don't want to do that. The truth is we can't be good enough or bad enough to remove ourselves from God's love. His love is a, an external reality. It is an objective reality in our lives. And we can give permission for it to identify us on our behalf but we can't do anything to remove it. The voice of ambition says, I, uh, what I do is who I am. Can I do enough? But the voice of the gospel, this gospel thinking says, no, Christ has done enough for you. Your behaviors do not dictate your identity. The same would be true for any other external circumstances or possessions. Your external circumstances do not dictate your identity. Not only the things you do, but also the things that happen to you. Those things do not dictate your or my identity. Any external circumstances, they can be taken from us. They can be changed. You could lose your job tomorrow. Right? You could lose all of your possessions tomorrow. And when our identity is in our appetite, meaning, do I have enough? When those things are taken, we're shaken. Who I am gets changed, it gets stolen. But the love of God is untouchable and it's unshakable. Because if God has not withheld his son, how much more will he give you anything else that he has? And then finally, the question that we need to ask ourselves is who or what have you trusted in for your identity? Whether it's approval, ambition, or appetite, 
We give those things permission to identify us. We give them permission to dictate who we are. And we need to constantly be asking the, the question, who or what have we trusted in for our identity? What have we given our permission away to? I wanna ask us to give permission away to God the Father to identify us and nothing else, no one else. That is the place that is unshakable. It is untouchable. Everything else can be taken, shaken, or touched, but God's love cannot be touched. So who or what have we given permission to identify us? Where have we given away that permission? When the crisis of life and the suffering of life point out our paradoxical thinking, we can know these things to be true, that nothing can separate us from God's love. Let's hold on to God the Father revealed in Jesus what he has done for us, that he is on our side and nothing can touch that. When we can settle that in our own hearts, we become a certain type of people. Have you ever interacted with a person who needs nothing for you but seems to give everything they are to you? That is a person who has a solid identity. We live in neighborhoods and we work in uh, spaces and we interact with people all over uh, who are used to people needing something from them, being utilized. We utilize each other. Did you know that? When our identity, uh, when we give permission to God the Father to identify us and nothing else, we become the type of person that when we interact with others, they encounter someone who needs nothing from them, but is willing to pour everything out for them in the same way as Jesus. We become the types of people that, are, uh, that other people want to be around and, and want in their lives because we can just be present with them with expecting nothing in return. We don't need their affirmation. We don't need their approval. We don't need anything from them. We have enough in Christ. So we are able to just be ourselves to them. That's the kind of person other people want around them. We can be that kind of people. We can be those people in our neighborhoods. We can be those people in our workplaces, in our friendships, in our own families. We can stop looking at our own family members to try to fill something in us, and instead we can just start pouring ourselves out on their behalf. That's what the love of God does in us. That's what I'm inviting us to. That's what God's inviting us to. Let's receive that this morning in prayer.